Okay, so back to where we were in the first place. Documentary and feature. Right, let's begin here. All right, cool. So let's go to feature. No, let's. Story of the Star Wars trilogy, Empire. Isn't this what what is on Disney Plus? Okay, let's go to featurettes. We all know we want, we want to see that. Characters of Star Wars: The Birth of the Lightsaber, The Forces with Them, The Legacy of Star Wars. Uh, let's start with the top. The characters of Star Wars. Let's roll. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we go. If you haven't hit like already, do it. The script was uh, unlike any I'd ever seen before, um, but what was recognizable about it were the uh, relationships between the main characters that I recognized. What do you think of Ron? Trying not to, kid. Good. It was all in that screenplay. The humor was there. The heart was there. Still, still a lot of spirit. We had a, a pirate, and we had a wizard. And we had a farm boy and a princess, and we had bickering robots, and I thought, what's not to like? It was a form of popular storytelling that allowed you to just enter the world of the characters and to enjoy the story. It has become a cultural phenomenon. Its motifs, phrases, May the force be with you. and characters are a part of the consciousness of millions of people around the globe. And though the Star Wars universe might seem to have sprung fully formed from the consciousness of George Lucas, the truth is it might have been a very different place. Yeah, originally, the story was about Luke Starkiller, and Starkiller was ultimately the father, uh, and the twins were his kids and then that eventually evolved into the story being about one of the twins and that the father being the bad guy. And it, you know, it went through a lot of different drafts of moving the story around and trying to get the right fit. Though they populate a galaxy far, far away, the characters of Star Wars embody classic archetypes from myth and legend. Good luck. Lucas spent over two years developing the screenplay, carefully fitting the pieces together. As you write a screenplay, you sort of move characters around. It's like a chess set. You have a certain set of main characters, you have secondary characters, you have sidekicks, you have villains, and you have henchmen. And you kind of move these around to figure out how the story is going to play itself out. To help translate his characters from the written page to three-dimensional life, Lucas hired illustrator Ralph McQuarrie. I found it very helpful in doing science fiction and fantasy to work with an illustrator to try to make concrete what I have in my head so I don't have to spend a huge amount of time describing every little minute detail. I can just simply do a picture of it. And I sit down with Ralph and I tell him what the character is, what it looks like, and then he does a series of sketches and I take those sketches and I say, no, I want it more like this, I want it more like that, I want the eyes bigger, I want it smaller, and sometimes completely different. No character represents a more primal archetype than the hero of Star Wars, Luke Skywalker. There is no particular character in mythology or in stories that connect directly with Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker is a hero, and uh, it's more uh, generic, it's more of a motif that comes out of the various books that are written about mythology and fairy tales, such as Joseph Campbell's uh, Hero of a Thousand Faces. Luke Skywalker is a tough character, uh, because by the nature of that type of character, they have to be an everyman. They have to be the person that we, the audience, relate to. He was the person that we went on this journey with. The dashing figure of Luke Skywalker was destined to capture the imagination of a generation of filmgoers. But would he have been as popular had he been played by, perhaps, Kenny Baker? There was a point where Luke Skywalker was going to be a midget. And all the people, you know, on the farm and everything, the uh, ant. George gets canceled. And the uncle and that whole group were all going to be little people. That boy is our last hope. No, there is another. It was always about these twins and their father. That was sort of the only thing that's sort of been a constant through the whole thing. And at some point, I took the female twin and made her the hero. And then eventually, I shifted it around to the male character. 
I'm not going anywhere. They're going to execute her. Look, a few minutes ago, you said you didn't want to just wait here to be captured. Now all you want to do is stay? Marching into the detention area is not what I had in mind. But they're going to kill her. Better her than me. One of the ways of telling a story is to have two main characters that are exactly the opposite from each other so that they contrast. I had Luke, who was the idealistic, naive farm boy who was going out into the world, a little frightened to do that, take on the responsibilities. We had the old man who was the guide and the nurturing person who was sort of sending him off and giving him advice as he goes. You must learn the ways of the Force if you're to come with me to Alderaan. Alderaan? And then you usually have the, the sidekick whose morals and everything else are very opposite of the hero. And so they kind of disagree on things. And in this case, one of the main themes is compassion and helping one another, uh, of selflessness as opposed to selfishness. So I have one character who's very selfless. I'm Luke Skywalker, I'm here to rescue you. And another one who's very selfish. I ain't in this for your revolution, and I'm not in it for you, princess. I expect to be well paid. I'm in it for the money. So I put them together, and so they're always contrasting their points of view on the situation. Well, Han Solo is that character that we always wished we could be. I think most of us felt like Luke Skywalker, but we would have loved to have been Han Solo. Lucas originally envisioned Han Solo as a huge green-skinned monster with large gills. Raised by Wookiees, Solo had befriended Chewbacca at an early age, and together they had become space pirates. Han Solo was meant to be a very nefarious character. He did start out as a you know, monster or a strange alien character. I finally settled on him being human so that there'd be more relationship between the three of them. That's where Chewbacca came in as the, as the kind of alien sidekick. While several of the Star Wars characters are drawn from myth and legend, Han Solo's sidekick Chewbacca was inspired by a more personal relationship. My original inspiration for Chewbacca was my dog Indiana. She was the one that sat there with me as I was writing the script all the time. She'd ride in the car with me and be my co-pilot. And when she'd sit in the car, um, she would be as tall as I am. She was an Alaskan Malamute. She was very big. I thought that was a funny image. And as I was looking for a kind of alien co-pilot for Han Solo, I immediately thought of Indiana. We had a, an old 30s illustration showing a hairy, ape-like creature that George kind of liked. And I said, well, let's make it more like a squirrel face or cat face or, you know, we tried to get something that was generic but not specific to any animal breed. We started out with the idea of him being looking sort of like a lemur. And then I did one creature with the You ran him Chewbacca look like this? I removed the breast because it wasn't to be a female. And I put a bandolier on there and gave him a weapon. As in almost every aspect of the filmmaking process, creating the characters of Star Wars was a collaborative effort. I come up with an idea in my head of what I want a character or an alien or a set to be. Then I work with the, the designers to take what I'm thinking about and make it concrete onto a drawing. I got him! Great kid! Don't get cocky! Then I have to take that drawing and turn it over to the art department or the prop department or the makeup department. And they have to then translate that into a real mechanical plastic and fur reality. We didn't really have the ability to do animated characters at that point. So I made the decision with Chewbacca that it would be a, a, a large man in a suit. They said it was hairy and big, and that was all that, they, all that they said. We arrive up there, looked around, and there is Ralph McQuarrie's drawing of a Neanderthal man. But the difference was Ralph had put Bermuda shorts and a vest on Chewie. <laughs> Trust him, trust him! To make Chewbacca's facial expressions believable, Lucas turned to one of the few experts in the field. I was working with Stuart Freeborn, who did the apes on 2001. I thought it was a fantastic job he did, and since we had this Wookiee, I said, well, we'll use the same mechanics that they used in 2001 to create the apes. 356, take four. Right. So he tried to take what Ralph had drawn and interpret it to use Peter Mayhew, and he is a certain structure, he has a certain way of walking, he has certain eyes, and taking his actual skeletal structure and turning that into a costume. 
and a face that would just mechanically would work. And that changes the design. I mean, just, you know, just by the nature of the reality of it, it changes it. Whenever you have a, a design concept and you put it into reality, most of the times, especially in the early years, uh, it would change everything. Now with digital technology, it's much easier to conceive of something, design something, and have it come out just that way. But in the old days, that didn't happen. We seem to be made to suffer. It's our lot in life. One of the movies that inspired me in the beginning of Star Wars was uh, Kura Kurosawa's Hidden Fortress. It's about two peasants who are kind of the lowest social level in feudal Japan. <laughs> Traveling with a general and a princess and a, you know, very, very aristocratic people. <laughs> So the story is told from their point of view. It's the, the lowest social category watching this adventure that is taking place on the grandest level of international diplomacy. They're designed as a kind of Mutt and Jeff, Abbott hmm. and Costello, Laurel and the Hardy comic relief to the movie. I've just about had enough of you. Go that way. You'll be malfunctioning within a day, you near at its scrap pile. And don't let me catch you following me, begging for help, because you won't get it. In order to make the comic relief work, you have to create two characters that are very, very different from one another. So I made one a little asteroid droid that had no human resemblance at all, and then the other one, which was a more elegant translator droid that was more anthropomorphic in nature and more programmed to interface with human beings. I am C-3PO, human-cyborg relations, and this is my counterpart, R2-D2. Hello. And I wanted a very elegant, sophisticated design concept for 3PO because 3PO came from a more elegant, sophisticated environment. I'm not much more than an interpreter and not very good at telling stories. The Did early he? concept of 3PO Anakin's was inspired backyard. by the uh, robot junkyard? in Metropolis. 3PO was to look like uh, the Metropolis robot, only a boy. Then I made an illustration showing uh, 3PO and R2 coming across the desert. We could see their base capsule in the background. One of the very difficult things about creating 3PO is that I needed to create a face that was absolutely neutral, that I could then read into whatever emotion it was that was being put forth in the scene. I had a, a sculptress come in and do a series of heads to try to get to a head that was absolutely neutral and had no emotion on it whatsoever. I wanted all the reactions to be Jesus, that's from terrifying. the environment Holy and the story crap. around it. So that if he was happy, oh you would my read God. happiness into his face. If he was sad, you'd read sadness into his face. And it wouldn't be Jesus. distorted at all by the uh, physical like configuration. Like something hiding in your closet late at night. Don't you call me a mindless philosopher, you overweight glob of grease. Now come out before somebody sees you. I also oh, thank originally the was maker. Make him more like an oily used car dealer or a salesman. He was going to be more like a salesman who was always trying to please and always saying the right thing. Can you speak Bocce? Of course I can, sir. It's like a second language to me. I'm a yeah, All right, him. shut up. I'll take this. Shut <laughs> up, sir. <laughs> but as Tony Daniels came into it, he was a very good actor, and he had this British accent, and I just fell in love with the accent. I tried to use all different kinds of people. I tried to use the used car dealer. I tried to use the salesman. None of it worked except for Tony as this kind of fussy British butler. The very first day on the film set on Star Wars, we got there. They'd only just managed to finish the costume. And I actually got dressed up and I had to say to the continuity girl, could you take a Polaroid, please, and, and hold it up? And through the little eyes, I looked I looked at a Polaroid of myself, and that's where I really learned totally what I looked like for the day. If I told you half the things I've heard about this Jabba the Hutt, you'd probably short circuit. We first met 3PO, uh, you know, as this, this total uh, gold thing. It's very dangerous to have a shiny thing on the set because it reflects everything from the car driving up with the supplies to the tea lady to the nurse. And also George's world was full of muck and, and gristle and sort of grime, and so 3PO is bespattered like that, totally against his nature, of course. This oil bath is going to feel so good. I've got such a bad case of dust contamination, I can barely move. He always gets polished up at the end. This started in Star Wars as a kind of end of the play, walk down costume, as you might say. Always polished up brightly. Part of the fun of 3PO is he has no soul. He is programmed to think a particular way and be compassionate. 
but he doesn't really know what that means. Should we take the professor in the back and plug him into the hyperdrive? Mm. Sometimes I just don't understand human behavior. And sometimes he gets frustrated and something has very human-like qualities, but they don't have a, a central place where he can think independently. Darth Vader, on the other hand, as he becomes more mechanical, he loses more and more of his ability to even think like a human. Here we go, Vader. Originally, there was the good father, the bad father, and the good father was Anakin Starkiller, and the bad villain was Darth Vader. In the course of writing the scripts, those two characters switched around a little bit, and I went back and forth. Ultimately, they merged into being one character. Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. He told me enough. He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. The decision to combine the good and evil fathers of ancient legend created an unforgettable character, one further enhanced by his nature as something between man and machine. The idea that Darth Vader was becoming more machine than man, and that he was losing his soul, and that he was losing his humanness, uh, was a main theme. In the case of Darth Vader, Lucas's initial design concept evoked Bedouin warriors of the Arabian Peninsula. George came in and described Darth Vader to me as a figure that fluttered in on the wind, a very dark, spooky character. He might have a big helmet on like a Japanese medieval warrior. McQuarrie quickly realized the practical realities of space travel would affect his designs for the character. His solution would come to be one of Darth Vader's most sinister traits. He's going to have to come from one spacecraft and they're going to blow a hole in this tunnel and come into this other spacecraft. I started to get worried about him having to cross this space in a vacuum without a, a spacesuit. So George kind of reluctantly said, well, go ahead and give him some sort of breathing mask. Like everything I was doing, we said we'd get to a certain point and he'd say, OK, that's fine. Let's go on to something else. Mm. We left Darth Vader the way I had it. And he got into the film pretty much like I painted him. Cool. What George Lucas has done, the same as Tolkien, is he's created memorable characters. You've taken your first step into a larger world. I thought he had reached something very powerful and primordial. I'm not afraid. You will be. You think of Star Wars today, some, what, 25 years after the original release, and you sort of don't remember the special effects, but you remember the characters. It's the creation of Darth Vader and Han Solo and Yoda and Luke Skywalker and Chewbacca. It's the characters that remain. Why, you stuck up, half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder. Who's scruffy-looking? To be fair, you have to start with George's genius for understanding human nature and, and film. There's nothing for me here now. I want to learn the ways of the Force and become a Jedi like my father. These mythologies have stood the test of time and become beloved by audiences because of the fact that they have such wonderfully created and performed characters. Great shot, kid. That was one in a million. Remember, the Force will be with you, always. Han, can you reach my lightsaber? Well, can anyone? <laughs> That's my face. <laughs> 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 I thought that was a deer's ass. <laughs> Cut! Cheer them on, guys. Cheer them on. Try and climb up. Get back down again. Beat the oh. sh** out of them. <laughs> This is my favorite song of uh, all Star Wars.
All right, so next we're going to cover the birth of the lightsaber. Stay tuned.